Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Frank Music. You can see my uh, name up there. It's just plain old music, not Musiac or Musiac or whatever. It gets a lot of different names. Um, there is a big gap here, um, and part of this conference is about gaps, and there's a big gap here, I'm afraid, um, in our field, in, aud in auditory. Uh, I recall back in the early 80s, I was, Mike Gazaniga was uh, recruiting a research team to study split brain at my old alma mater, Dartmouth, where I was there. And uh, Gazaniga recruited me, which I was surprised, uh, mostly because of Don Wilson's recommendation. Uh, but I'll never forget what he told me. Uh, and at that time, he, the term neuroscience was just emerging. It was mostly neuropsychology and physiological psychology and uh, things like that. But uh, Mike told me, he said, you know, Frank, he said, uh, this auditory stuff is absolutely fundamental, and yet we are overlooking it like we won't believe. And we've got to have somebody in that area to look at these split brain people. And I never forgot that. And so we move ahead about 30 some years. I get a call from Monica several years ago. Monica says, you know, Frank, I, I read that you're doing neuroaudiology work and she says, I have to tell you that uh, some of the hemispherectomy work, it looks like we're look overlooking this auditory part of it. And yet it is so important to most how other things work in the brain. And so I'm here today to try to fill in that gap. And it is a gap. There's no question about it. And there's not much research in our area. So I'm going to do a little teaching as well as uh, relay some research because that's where I think I can make the most uh, advances in understanding in this area. Let's see if this works. Which one do I press here, this one? There we go. Couple main sta statements. And I don't think anyone who thinks about it will disagree with this. The auditory system is what fuels speech and language. And if you look at the data from uh, 100 years past, all you have to look at is people with hearing loss or deafness, and you see deficits in speech and language, especially in terms of, uh, you know, as they're growing up and as they, as they mature. And the other thing I wanted to bring out as the second most important point is that there are two systems here. The peripheral system, which we're all pretty familiar with, and the central system, which we're not at this point. They have to work together, but they do different jobs. One is dependent on the other. So, uh, the peripheral system is, of course, what we think about when we think about the ear, the external, middle, inner ear, and the auditory nerve, as you see over here on your left. And the central auditory system, it starts with a cochlear nucleus in the lower lateral pons, and that's where the central auditory system uh, begins. And the functions are, you know, reciprocal. They are synergic, but they do different things. And I think we've got hung up on create, creating a situation where we believe everything is a peripheral problem and nothing is a central problem. And the research in our area, of course, is turning that around slowly but surely. So this is peripheral, and the red is the central. Now, what is interesting here is that we have, I'm going to emphasize these terms because they're important what I'm going to say, and that is ipsilateral and contralateral rather than right or left. Ipsilateral simply means that there is a pathway from the ear to the auditory cortex that is on the same side it is being stimulated. That's an ipsilateral stimulation. Stimulate the right ear, there is a, a pathway to the right auditory cortex, no question. There's also a contralateral pathway, and this is different than other systems. Motor system, visual system are totally crossed. Auditory system is crossed, but it also has ipsilateral inputs. But the thing that's important here, and I tried to just diagram this, is that, um, whoops, I'm sorry. How do I go back here again? Well, what did I, there we go. Well, let me just go ahead here. The contralateral system is five times many neurons reaching the cortex than the ipsilateral system. So though we have two inputs, 
one is far more dominant than the other and far more susceptible to injury. Okay? And that's what I'm trying to show here. So the contralateral is right ear to left hemisphere, to left ear to right hemisphere. Ipsilateral is right to right, left to left. Well, what's interesting is that a lot of the simpler tasks and simpler stimuli that we listen to in our everyday conversations, our exposure to our environment, are either relatively simple stimuli, which are easily handled by a small part of the brain and a big part of the ear. However, as shown in this uh, cartoon slide, as the stimuli become more difficult, the central system plays a bigger and bigger role. Now, there is not any time that anybody hears anything that both systems aren't working together, okay? But the ratio changes dramatically in terms of if you look at the complexity of the stimulus. So as you increase complexity, you are going to engage more and more of the central auditory nervous system and the brain, okay? So here's some examples. A simple acoustic stimulus in our environment, a whistle. What do you do with a whistle? It doesn't tell you much. It could be a warning, but primarily what are you doing? You're detecting it. You know it's there. Great, super, okay? A uh, simple acoustic uh, a task would be the detection of sound, okay? That task simply means, yeah, I hear it. Can you tell me anything about it? No, but I hear it. That's simple detectability. Complex acoustic sim, uh, signals, the most common one is trying to hear people talk when there's a lot of background noise. You've just heard uh, five minutes ago about how some of these children cannot tolerate a lot of noise. That's very true. And to try to pick out a primary signal or target signal when it's in a myriad of other acoustic signals is a tremendously complex task that the auditory system has got to do and has to be in tip-top shape to do it. Complex task was to take two sounds, beep, beep. You know there's two sounds, but then to tell to the discrimination between the two. That all of a sudden becomes a difficult task and one that requires much more than just the ear capability. So this is what we're all used to seeing. We're all used to seeing an audiogram. Yeah, the, in first grade or second grade, your children get this test in school by the school nurse and say, yeah, they have uh, good hearing and, and they have a normal audiogram. Well, the only thing that the audiogram tells us is the detectability of sound and the sensitivity of it. It doesn't tell us anything else about hearing. Absolutely nothing. And this is kind of the way it looks. X's are left ear, zeros are right ear. We have a normal, mild, moderate, severe, profound hearing loss that's categorized that way. And we're all kind of used to that. The problem is, back in 1957, there was a great paper published by Goldstein where he uh, examined a 21-year-old hemispherectomy patient. And in that classic paper, Goldstein published that this 21-year-old hemispherectomy patient had perfectly normal hearing. Why? Because their audiogram was normal. And it was. Well, most people with hemispherectomies, unless they have some kind of otologic problem, are going to have a normal audiogram. But that made it etched itself in the literature. And even today, I talk to my fellow neurosurgeons, and some of them still say, and neurologists too. Well, hemispherectomy, we know that it doesn't affect hearing. You know, it, these people have normal audiograms. That's only a small part of the story. A normal audiogram does not mean you have normal hearing because normal hearing involves a lot more than just detectability. It involves at least 13 or 14 well-defined psychoacoustic tasks that are necessary to be performed by the brain and the ear in order for you to have actually normal hearing. So, what are some of these particular kinds of things that we can assess that are more complex, that tell us more about hearing uh, rather than just detectability? Well, 
I'm embarrassed to say that our field hasn't done a lot in this area. And that's why I'm here to maybe <laughs> encourage everybody to do more. But there, are, there is some data, though, scant. Uh, and I'm going to do my best to put it in an in, in a intelligible and reasonable way. The first one is dichotic listening task. And dichotic listening task means you're listening to two different signals at the same time. And it's been around a long time. In our everyday environment, we have to do this a lot. Whether you believe it or not, we do. At cocktail parties, you want to listen to what someone is saying over here, but also pick up someone that just mentions your name over here. And it's difficult, but you can do it. Well, it's, a, it's also been developed into a very, very good task for auditory processing. Speech and noise. Well, you know where this comes from. It comes from the fact that people complain that I can't hear a noise. In the audiology clinics, the most common complaint across all patients is, I have trouble hearing a noise. Okay. And some of that is peripheral, but some of it is central, meaning the brain is creating those problems. And then the third one where there's been a fair amount of work is localization, localizing sound, which is absolutely critical to some of these kids. Because, you know, as we tell the children that have unilateral hearing loss on one side, we tell their mom and dad, don't, trust, don't let them trust their hearing crossing the road because they won't be able to localize where the traffic's coming from, and that's very true. And remember, it is not just the periphery, but also the central nervous system, where in fact, if there is dysfunction or a lesion, any place along that pathway, you in essence have one side that is doing better than the other, including localization. And believe it or not, another important thing with localization, as we've learned in the last 10 years, is it helps you hear at cocktail parties. Yes, the truth of the matter is, is that when you are listening and noise, the ability to quickly localize the speaker aids in the ability to hear a noise. But if it takes you a long time to localize the sound or you can't do it, you suffer in terms of your ability to hear in noise. So here are some examples of the tests that we use. We present digits bilaterally at the same time, words, and even uh, phonemes. And so what happens when we knock out one hemisphere? Okay, and I'm just going to direct mostly my comments to hemispherectomy. Well, what happens is that the ipsilateral side performs fine. But the contralateral side, because that's where most of all the neurons are, if it's compromised, will show a deficit on that side. And the total ability to perform the task is overall reduced uh, rather dramatically. So we have good test performance on the ipsilateral side and terrible test performance on the other side. Well, here's uh, three or four studies, and I picked these because these were the best ones. And, and uh, again, I'm embarrassed because we don't have more. But the point is, is that the deficits, you don't need a chi-square to figure out. They are dramatic. These are all people with normal audiograms and normal speech recognition scores in quiet. You put them in a di dichotic paradigm and they fall apart. These scores are essentially bordering on what we call auditory neglect. That is a, almost a, a total dysfunction of the one side. Okay? And these are not unusual. Uh, all of these studies uh, have, have shown very similar type things uh, in this, uh, in, with this kind of uh, paradigm. Uh, localization. Well, this is one of the ways. There are many localization tasks, but here's one of the ways that we do localization. So the listener is in front of a set of speakers, and each speaker will send out a certain sound or signal. And all they have to do is with a little laser pointer or a computer in front of them, they point to where they think the sound's coming from. And most people can do this amazingly well. The auditory system in terms of localization is unbelievably sharp, uh, has unbelievable abilities that way. So this is just one of the ways that it's done. But if you look at hemispherectomy uh, patients, they have trouble. They are 30 degrees off 
in some cases, knowing where sound is coming from. 30 degrees is a lot. Uh, and, and it makes it difficult for them to hear a noise as well as to localize sounds that may be important to their well-being. And so there's another major deficit here in terms of this study and, and at least two or three other studies that have been well done. And then speech and noise. And this is simply uh, a situation where we use specially selected words and we have them repeat them in quiet and then we douse it with uh, either speech spectrum noise or white noise to make the task more difficult. And uh, this is just an example showing uh, a noise competition uh, visual analog for it. So it's more difficult to say the word run or in, in, uh, in noise than in quiet. And again, this is a very low, low, we only have a couple of patients, but again, you see this dramatic result. Uh, sure, we need, we'd like to have 100 of these, but we don't. But the point is, is that the ones that undergo this uh, very type of uh, testing show rather dramatic results, whether it be left or right hemispherectomy. So, um, what are some of these symptoms? Now, we haven't seen a lot of, of, of children with hemispherectomy, but we have seen a truckload of people with various kinds of central auditory deficits over the years. And when they have a central auditory deficit, there are certain symptoms that do come out and that we do see. And here's, a, here's some of them. First of all, you start off with a normal audiogram. If you have a, a, a report of a normal audiogram and that parent, that teacher, or that child saying, I'm having trouble hearing, I can't understand what's going on, or noise is driving me crazy, guess what? It's probably central, okay? So the first thing, look at the normal audiogram. If it is not normal, the likelihood, yes, it's probably something wrong with their ears, and maybe they have sensory neural or conductive hearing loss, okay? Hearing and background noise, we've talked about. Hearing in echoey rooms. These kids, they go into the gymnasium for gym class in, in middle school or whatever, they have no idea what's going on. Why? Because the gym has such poor acoustics. And you might as well take them away because they're not going to follow anything in echoey rooms. They have trouble with teachers that talk fast. Some teachers, are very, even in elementary school, relay information very quickly. They undoubtedly will have these problems. People with accents. They have trouble localizing sound, and often they are very, very poor in terms of musical skills. Why? Because auditory processing is a forerunner to musical skills, just like it is to language, speech, and a lot of cognition. So there is this kind of relationship. Many times these kids with a central deficit and much smaller lesions than we see with hemispherectomy or temporal lobectomy, They'll be in class for a while and they just start going like this. I can't, you know, it's too much. You know, the child across the aisle is talking to them while the teacher's trying to talk to them. So these are just some of the things. But the point that I want to make that I can't talk about today because of the scope is there are two big ways that these kids with central deficits can be helped. One is with auditory training. And we heard about plasticity this morning. Well, auditory training is a form of plasticity, that if you train on the kinds of deficits that these children have, as categorized by temporal processing, dichotic listening, listening and noise, and actually break those down and work on the training of those, it is amazing how much better they will do. And the other thing are assistive listening devices. And the one thing that assistive listening devices do better than anything else is they cut all the background noise in the classroom. So if you have an assistive listening device with a teacher wears, talks to the microphone, directly carries by radio signal to the earphone or ear insert for the child, they have essentially no background noise and they have no room reverberation. The two worst things that can create problems in these kids with central auditory deficits. So, I thank you.